she was home by 9.30. On Thursdays, she was always home by that time, sometimes a little earlier. You couldn't be too careful. When he came home from a lodge meeting, it was always 10.15 p.m. You could set your watch by it. Her father had gotten him into it, and he had gone into it just to satisfy them both. But after joining, he found that he liked the civil service aspect of it. He was so good at organizing charitable and social events that he was nominated and elected to the Board of Governors. As chairman of the scholarship committee, he worked long and hard to gain support and raise money for the project. Through his efforts, they were able to fund two scholarships a year for deserving young people at community colleges. She made sure she was clean and presentable by the time he came home. Sometimes she went to bed, but more often she waited for him and they talked about the day before, how the scholarship fund was coming along, the ordinary things that married people chatted about before bed. Sometimes they made love, but usually they just cuddled until they fell asleep. The first glimmer that something might be wrong came when she pulled into the driveway. She couldn't get into the garage. His car was parked at an angle, blocking both doors. A sense of unease swept over her as she got out of the car. He had spoken to her only a few minutes ago, and she had told him she was at home. Damn it, she loved this house. A firm believer that it was better to live in an apartment, she'd let him talk her into this house when her lease was up. It was a fairly new three-bedroom house on a small lot. The main advantage was the porch that completely girdled the house. In front, there was a swing set under the ceiling fans. They often sat under them, swaying slightly, enjoying the warm summer evenings. She was savvy enough to realize what he was up to. It was a family home. Mentally, she could even envision swings and a kiddie pool in the enclosed backyard. One of the happiest moments of her life up to this point had happened last month when they were planting a new flower bed. To get his attention, she threw some soil at him. Hey, you. Hello to you, too. Did I miss something? No, I just needed to tell you I'm ready. No, you're not. We haven't put in the fertilizer and lime yet. We have to mix it in before we plant. Not that kind of ready. I'm ready to have a baby. Good thing the flower beds are soft, she thought as he threw himself on top of her and pulled her against him. The lovemaking that followed was slow, gentle more like an exchange of souls than bodily fluids. She had never felt so loved. The most amazing thing was the tears he shed. He was always so calm, so in control of himself. She stepped out onto the porch and headed for the front door, trying to tread as quietly as possible. Hello, Les. She jumped up. He was sitting in the swing. The porch light wasn't on, so she didn't see him. Jesus, Kenny, you scared me. Let's go inside. No. Just sit next to me for a while. Let's enjoy the breeze for a few minutes. He patted the spot next to him on the swing. Where have you been? You said you were here, but you weren't when I got home. She fidgeted awkwardly on the swing. Oh, I didn't want to sleep. I remembered I was almost out of gas and didn't want to try to fill up in the morning, so I drove to the gas station on the corner. There was only a quarter tank in the car, and she hoped he wouldn't check. He reached out and took her hand. Seriously? I could have sworn you just got back from the hideaway motel on 5th. Number 69. Funny, isn't it? That's the number, isn't it? Jerry's pretty superstitious about that sort of thing. Isn't that where you usually meet every Thursday from 6.30 to 9 p.m.? She aghast and tried to pull her hand away, but he gripped it tightly and wouldn't let go. Relax, Les. I'm not going to hurt you, but I want you to promise to listen without interrupting. I promise that when we're done, it'll be your turn to talk and mine to listen. Will you do that for me? I will. She hunched over, squeezed herself into a lump, and sobbed loudly. He continued to speak in a quiet voice, devoid of intonation. When I first found out, I refused to believe it. You were seen by one of your friends? No, I don't know which one. She sent me an email from a public account. I ignored it at first. But the seed was planted and it germinated, creeping into the crevices of my brain until I finally had to get rid of it by refuting it. Then I checked it out. I asked a friend to watch the house for me. Do you have any idea how humiliating it is to ask someone to do that? Especially if they're a friend of both of us. This favor may have ended my friendship with him. It was horrifying to watch him struggle with his emotions as he laid out the case to me. He even had pictures of you and Jerry going in and out of the motel room, including the hello and goodbye kisses. Lucky for us, he doesn't know what kind of person that was. Now he tries to avoid me. 
I think the pain he saw on my face that day is what he sees now every time he looks at me. Small sobs came out of her mouth. She tried to speak, but he gently put his fingers to her lips. Hush, you promised to listen first. He pressed his fingers to her lips until he felt her nod lightly. Good, I'll try not to take too long. The porch light was off. The only illumination of the scene was the light filtering through the living room drapes. Though he continued to speak in a calm, even tone, his face was a mask of pain and suffering. But in the darkness, she couldn't see it. When he showed me the pictures, I swear the sound of my heart breaking almost deafened me. Literally, my ears rang. But after thinking about it, I felt like I needed to know why. Why could you two do this to us? For the first time in ages, his composure was broken, and a shuddering sob broke out. For a minute, he breathed deeply, fighting to control himself. Your own sister, Leslie, how could you? When your mom died, she took you in and practically raised you. You should know that at 15, the last thing she would have wanted was the responsibility of a nine-year-old. But she made it through. Skipped dates, dances, school events to be there for you. Your dad told me that one year money was so tight that she gave up Christmas so you could have something under the tree. She loved you more like a daughter than a sister. You know she'll find out eventually. Even if she deserves the truth, I'll never tell her. I love her too much to hurt her like that. Maybe she can forgive Jerry. She's the best woman I know. But to forgive you, Les, I don't know if her heart is that big. Tears rolled down her cheeks, gaining speed and volume as she realized for the first time the consequences of her actions. She remembered feeling elation and smugness at having a secret, at getting away with something. Now it seemed so childish to her. Her mind was already searching for ways to fix the situation, desperately hoping she could make things right. How could she have been so stupid? But deep down, she knew that he loved her so much that he would forgive her anything. It was her anchor, her rationalization, that even if she got caught, he would never leave her. For the first time, doubt crept into her soul. I should have known, Les. Why? It was consuming me. That's why I bugged your purse. Remember that cute little flashlight I bought for you? It was also a voice-activated voice recorder. It's amazing what you can find online these days. You know what struck me? There was no spark between you two. It was like, we're here. Let's fuck so we can go home to our families. One time he even called it a quick bite to tear off a piece, and you giggled and agreed. If it meant so little to both of you, why did you do it? Oddly enough, it gave me hope. If it meant so little, maybe it would be over soon. If it did, I would take my knowledge of your affair to my grave. I had a plan. I was going to change my habits, make it difficult for you to continue your meetings. I thought that if it meant so little and I made your meetings difficult, dropped enough hints to scare you, you two would just give up. I even removed the tape recorder from your purse. But then I did something stupid. I listened to it. You want to know why I cried when you said you were ready to have our baby? Exactly because of that. And to me, it meant that your affair had run out of steam. He stopped and was quiet for a moment. He took her hand and shook it a little, shushing her when she tried to say something and reminding her that she'd get her chance later. After a while, he started again. Then I listened to the damn tape. It was your undoing, Les. I heard you tell him it was the last time, when he said, forever, I swear I heard angels, but they were demons gnashing their teeth in glee. If you don't remember your answer, I still have the tape. He pressed a button on the tape, and she heard her world crumble at her own words. Of course you don't, Jerry. Exactly enough to get me pregnant. I love him, and I want to make sure it's his baby. Two weeks after the doctor confirms I'm pregnant, you'll be back in the saddle. We may have to see each other more often. All my girlfriends say pregnancy is a constant turn on. Just be glad Kenny will be around to take over. Even in the darkness, Kenny noticed how pale her face had turned. Her rapid, shallow breathing indicated the onset of hyperventilation. He waited for her breathing to return to normal. You have no idea what was going through my head, Les. Horrible things, things so vicious and vile that I'm ashamed they came into my head. I was going to destroy you, maybe kill Jerry. A slow, miserable, agonizing death. Finally, I calmed down and thought things through rationally. For the last two weeks, I'd been thinking about what to do. It took me a while, but I came up with the perfect revenge. 
I bet you're dying to know, aren't you, Les? She was terrified. Well, honey, here it is. It was so easy, I don't know why it didn't occur to me sooner. You won't be able to love me anymore. It'll never be Kenny and Les again. From now on, it's just Kenny, just Leslie. We're no longer one. We'll never have children. The two girls I wanted because I thought there should be more girls like you in the world will never happen. A little boy with your grace and my height, there never will be. We will never go to Lama's class together. Childbirth preparation techniques. I will never rub lotion on your tummy to reduce stretch marks. I will never hold your hand and cut the umbilical cord in the delivery room. Childhood illnesses, seeing you off to kindergarten, middle school, high school graduation, college, it will never happen. No talking about the birds and the bees, no celebrating sports victories and consoling them when they lose, no driving lessons, no loss of sleep when they first start dating, no grandchildren. When your hands shake so badly you can't cut your golden anniversary cake, I won't help you hang on. You will never grieve for me and I for you when one of us is finally gone. This house we both love so much? I turned down an offer to buy it. We'll never own it together. It will never hold the memories of us. Finally, tears came to his eyes. You killed us, Les, as surely as if you'd put a gun to our heads and pulled the trigger. I've thought about it a lot. I'm tired of thinking, tired of crying, tired of feeling lost and alone. There must be a good woman looking for a guy whose only talent is to love her to the end, knowing that his love and trust will never be betrayed. Not next week, not next month, but soon, Les, soon I'll start looking. She has to be here somewhere. He let go of her hand and stood up, absent-mindedly shaking off his pants. I'm leaving now, Les. I've already taken what I wanted. It was very little. I wanted nothing to remind me of you. I didn't take any pictures of you or us together. I have enough mental images to last me the rest of my life. He reached the end of the porch and turned around. I hope you find someone, Les. Remember that when you do. I'm not going to leave town or change jobs, so we'll see each other from time to time. Please don't embarrass us by trying to talk. I'll leave, quietly if I can, loudly and rudely if I have to. One more thing and then I'll leave. It's up to you to tell your family. You made this mess. Clean it up however you want, but don't make me the bad guy. Just say it didn't work out and I'll back you up. Oh, I forgot. Oh, one more thing. Tell Jerry to stay away from me. If I'm in a bar, restaurant, or any other public place and he sees me, tell him to leave. I would never hurt you physically, but he doesn't deserve anything. And frankly, I don't even know if I want to control my anger. He was about to get into the car when the shock started to pass. Running up to him, she grabbed his arm. Wait, please wait, please wait. You said I could talk when you were done. Please sit back down. Let me explain. Beg if I have to. I swear I will never touch another man again. He gently removed her hand. Less, never, and I mean never, touch me again. I just did what I swore I would never do to you. I lied. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to hear your explanations and excuses. I don't want to hear your promises. It's over between us, Les. You don't know how sorry I am. He didn't say another word, just got in his car and drove away. She sat on the steps and cried uncontrollably as he drove away.